I believe. Hey, Randy, this is Ed Belding. Hey, Ed, how are you? I was Why, just this sounds just this sounds just like deja vu all over again. I know, it's another month, right? <laughs> yes, it is. So, Ed, you know, we have 18 people now, and I think it's a good time to start. That's a good number. So uh, let me okay. uh, start off by saying, Hi, everybody, and welcome to the South Brunswick Historical Society. I'm Randy Marsola. I'm a librarian here at the South Brunswick Library. And with me tonight is township historian Ed Belding. So, Ed, take it away. Okay, Randy, uh, I'd like to start with uh, just uh, uh, a review, and then I'll make, it, I'll make it quick, because in July, of course, we, we covered the 10-mile uh, run skirmish. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ran out of time on the what is called the Cranberry Skirmish or Nixon's Skirmish. And uh, so what we'll do is start right at the beginning of the second skirmish. Uh, now, those who are just tuning in for the first time, uh, a lot of people don't realize in, this, in our area that we actually did participate in some of the action of the war, not a battle. There was no battle in the uh, boundaries of South Brunswick Township, uh, but there were two skirmishes. And uh, I just wanted to define skirmish so you know the difference between that and a battle. Now, if you're familiar with the Battle of Princeton, uh, that's on a large scale. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that it only took 45 minutes to complete that battle and a victory for George Washington. On the heels of that battle uh, was the 10 mile run, run skirmish. And a skirmish is a small uh, conflict uh, between a uh, small number of uh, people on one side and, and a, a sizable number, but not a large number on the other side. Um, the uh, Skirmish uh, lasts a shorter amount of time. Uh, there are fewer weapons used, of course, because there are fewer combatants. Uh, skirmish is usually conducted in a smaller area than for a battle. Uh, usually ends up with uh, much fewer casualties than a battle. But the key thing with a skirmish is that if you have many of them over a period of time, and they tend to uh, discourage the people who are trying to fight in the regular way. And back in the Revolutionary War times, the British Army was probably the best uh, in the world. And they were used to fighting a certain way. And skirmishes was not their cup of tea. Whereas the Americans, irregulars and regulars combined, uh, or individually, uh, could do a skirmish uh, very well. And they were successful many times. I may have mentioned that there were over 100 skirmishes in New Jersey, and there are two known that happened in the South Brunswick area. So, Randy, that just introduces the uh, topic that we have tonight, this, okay. the Cranberry Skirmish. Okay. Okay, now the second thing I wanted to mention, since our contest last time was so successful. Uh, we got rave reviews, uh, New York Times and so forth. Uh, Randy and I thought it would be good to continue with the competition uh, for the listeners. Now, there are about 40 uh, units to this delivery tonight. And so every fourth uh, unit uh, I'm going to have a vocabulary word. Now, these vocabulary words come from the 18th century. So the older you are, the more chance you have of getting these right. Uh, these are Revolutionary War vocabulary terms, and all you need to do to win is to spell the word correctly or the, the term correctly and define it. If you do those two things correctly, then you will get a point. Uh, the maximum here is 10 points in this competition. Now, what you have to do is call out your first name, and the first one to call out their first name will be able to go first. 
If you get it wrong, then it goes to the second person. They get it wrong, goes to the third person and so forth. Now, as a bonus, bonus incentive, there are two prizes, one for first place and one for second place. The first place prize is a manuscript copy, original manuscript of the captain's rule, which tells the whole story about Captain Nixon's uh, foray into Monmouth County and so forth and around to Princeton uh, after the skirmish that takes place in South Brunswick. The second prize for coming in second place is an original painting framed by one of the oldest artists in South Brunswick. And only Randy knows who that oldest artist is. Yeah, it's a secret. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Um, Randy, I'm ready to start if you are. Yeah. Um, the first slide we have here, we have British regulars in Hessians. Oh, okay. Now, uh, I start this with uh, some uh, sources and, and a definition for a term for this whole thing that's going on. In 1777, the Forage War began in earnest. Now, the Forage War is called by David Hackett Fisher in, in his uh, book, Washington's Crossing, which I recommend highly for anybody who wants to read about the Revolutionary War in New Jersey. I believe it's the best general text that you can find. And as you're looking at the uh, British uh, regulars and the Hessians, uh, the, the terms for the Forge War uh, that were also used was Petit Guerre, meaning the small war, and the Dirty Little War. These were terms that were used to describe the same thing. Now, the Forage War involved a lot of skirmishes uh, rather than battles. And the refugees, uh, that's, that's a term that is used uh, for the, um, uh, the, the counter-insurrectionists uh, who fought on the side of the British regulars and the Hessians, but they fought basically on their own. And refugees, by definition, are those fighters who hid in the forests and swamp areas, especially the piney woods. Now, you have to understand that the piney woods was a much larger area than it is today, and actually uh, extended up uh, into Monmouth County and even some uh, places in Middlesex County. From these hiding places, the refugees ventured forth on raids to terrify locals, rob them, and traffic in contraband, also known as London trade. Uh, and they also uh, joined sometimes with the king's forces. As the war progressed, the activities of the refugees became synonymous with the traditional activities of the pine robbers who had been committing criminal acts and hiding from the law in desolate areas long before the war started. So what you have going on in the Forage War is you have the pine robbers who didn't really take sides in the war. They just wanted to rob people, and they were outlaws as you know them, and they were there before the war, during the war, and after the war. The refugees were sometimes mistaken for pine robbers. Pine robbers were sometimes mistaken for refugees. And I'll use the term refugees as an example of what's going to be in the contest. So in other words, if, you, if I asked you how to spell it, it's R-E-F-U-G-E-E. -E -E. And it's a different meaning than today. What it is is a loyalist who is hiding, especially in the woods, the piney woods, and is also uh, involved in foraging. In other words, attacking those people who were on the uh, American side fighting for the cause under George Washington. Okay, now, two other sources that I would recommend in case you want to read about these refugees. David J. Fowler uh, wrote The Egregious Villains, Wood Rangers and London Traders, subtitled The Pine Roberts Phenomenon in New Jersey During the Revolutionary War. Another one is Harry M. Ward, titled Between the Lines, Banditi, that's another term, of the American Revolution. 
Uh, so those are three sources, the Fisher one, the Fowler one, and the Ward one that I, I recommend highly. And I just wanted to say the Fisher one is excellent. I've used it and it gives really detailed um, uh, battle scenes that happened. I actually know the, the topography where it was and I go by it and it's very accurate. So the Fisher one I can vouch for. And another thing yeah. I found here is the Forage War is a term that's used just for the, um, the New Jersey skirmishes. It's, it's uh, New Jersey specific. Right. I didn't know right, that. Right. right. Okay. Um, I'm on to number two now. Um, and I, I just have uh, some uh, descriptive stuff. Uh, uh, are you ready for number two? Yeah, I have the Piney Woods of Monmouth County. Is that Got something? It. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, New Jersey in general and uh, Monmouth County in particular suffered the most from the, uh, the uh, forage war. The refugees played a major role in this state of affairs and had to be reckoned with at the local level. Troubles in Monmouth County spread to neighboring counties, including Middlesex. Refugee bands ventured there occasionally and wrought havoc on the countryside. And this is uh, an example of that, of course, is the Cranberry Skirmish. These refugees were adamant loyalists and native-born Americans who had been organized into small bands by local leaders who had some association with Tory leaders in New York. Okay, and uh, re I'm ready for the next one, Randy. Um, I have, well, there's another shot of the Piney Woods, but um, after that I have um, Robert, Captain Robert Nixon. Right, okay, now, uh, Captain Robert Nixon is going to be the leader for a horse troop, a militia horse troop that was organized in Middlesex County. Uh, he is going to be the hero of the skirmish that we're talking about tonight. Uh, so a couple of details about him so you can get some background and feel comfortable with him. Uh, he is a tough character. Uh, not necessarily the most likable character. And when I wrote about him, I uh, also highlighted his flaws as well as his, his strengths. He was probably, uh, on the, the day and, and night of the skirmish, he was probably coming from East Windsor, more specifically, probably Heightstown. It was called Hydestown uh, back in the day. Uh, he had business dealings there, and also his family was there. Uh, he lived near the bridge over Rocky Brook along Burlington Road, close to a mill. At the time, he held over 200 acres of arable land. Uh, he was a tanner by trade, and later he operated a tavern in Heightstown. Captain Robert Nixon was the commander of the Troop of Light Horse, 3rd Regiment, Middlesex County, New Jersey, as of January 27, 1777. So he rose to this appointment after the 10 Mile Run skirmish. And uh, in Mar on March 12th, that's the date of the skirmish that we're concentrating on tonight. Okay, and uh, this is uh, described as a skirmish against cattle thieves. Uh, Ruth Berg Walsh wrote about this in her book, uh, Cranberry Past and Present. Uh, John Whitclain Chambers, uh, Chambers of Rutgers also wrote about this. Uh, they wrote about it from the Cranberry perspective. In other words, Cranberry taking credit for it. But you have to keep in mind that Cranberry was part of the South Ward, hence actually part of South Brunswick uh, at the time. Uh, it wasn't until much later that Cranberry became independent of South Brunswick. Okay. Now, uh, Randy, uh, with that, uh, I'm, are, are, did you uh, have show enough of that? I showed um, a, a couple of maps, um, a couple of maps of, of you know, of Cranberry and his troops, uh, Nixon's Cranberry Troop of Horse. Um, okay. And then after that, I'm going against, uh, I have here a skirmish against cattle thieves mentioned in a few sources. 
and that's a was included in cranberry past and present so this okay, is okay good yeah okay good we're, we're right up to the time of the first vocabulary for the competition uh, what i wanted to mention on that uh, cranberry thing uh, i mean the the name that's commonly known as cranberry skirmish but if you know your uh, location, the battle has been described as north of Cranberry proper. <clears throat> and uh, if you can visualize where George's Road runs into 130, just a bit south of there, where John Wetherill would have had uh, a lot of his acreage, that's most likely where the skirmish actually took place. So it did not occur in Cranberry proper. Even the sources that uh, call it the Cranberry skirmish say that it's north of Cranberry proper. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, now here's your first term from Revolutionary War times, 18th century. The term is four horse. Four horse. Anybody want to take a guess at spelling and what it means? How about F O R E? Well, Randy, you're not involved in the competition. I can't play. I'm. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> the well, <let> me... <laughs> <laughs> Rick, Rick. Check his age, will you, please, somebody? <laughs> okay, four horse. A four horse wagon? You got to call out your first name. Oh, Bill, four horse wagon. Like in number four? Okay, four spell it marriage. first. Bill, spell it first. F four horse. F O U R. H. -O -R okay, that is, that is incorrect. You're thinking of a four horse team. That's not the term here. We're just, uh, we're, we're not saying four horse term, team. We're saying four horse. Terry? What's the name, Mary? Terry, as in Teresa. Oh, okay, Terry, okay. Terry, oh, okay. spell four horse. F-O-R-E hyphen H-O-R-S-E. Correct. For half a point. Now, can you give me a definition? That would be the four horse uh, part of a team, the head of the team. Okay, the head of uh, not a horse team, but a head of what type of team? They would go on ahead of the team. What, what would be the team? A scouting team? Yes, yes. In other words, a militia horse team, you calling it a team, they wouldn't use that word back in those days. But you are correct. In other words, this is the man on the horse who goes ahead like a scout to make sure the area is safe for the rest of the men to come along. So he goes on ahead. That is the four horse. So Terry, you get a full point. Okay, Randy, you're not upset, are you? Uh, a little bit, but I'll get over it, though. <laughs> I'll share it with you, Randy. I'll okay, share. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Randy wants the painting. He's, he's uh, trying to get second place, but he can't play. Okay, now uh, we're moving on to the next one. Um, uh, here I get into one of the reasons why I wrote about this skirmish. Uh, Randy, what do you have for that? I have uh, Robert Nixon's diary uh, that appeared right. to be lost. Oh. Right. Well, this is, this is what happened. Uh, when I was working with Seal Leadham on research on this skirmish, uh, Seal remembered that uh, down in Trenton, according to Robert Craig uh, and some other people down there, uh, that Nixon had a diary. And it was called Robert Nixon's Diary. And it was on file, and we could obtain a copy of it uh, to use for our research. So we went through the process of applying and so forth, and it turned out that they couldn't find the diary. It had been misfiled, and nobody knew where it was. 
Well, that didn't stop me. That encouraged me to write the whole story about it and, of course, elaborate on the story and turn it into a big deal so that Robert Nixon would not be forgotten and his troop of horse would not be forgotten. And we would remember that it actually took place in South Brunswick Township, uh, not in Cranberry. Okay, so that takes care of that, Randy. Okay. So next up, I have the papers of George Washington militiamen. Okay, yes. And uh, what I wanted to get into uh, uh, was uh, 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 sort of a description of the militiamen. So you know uh, what, what side you're on. You, you saw the, the regulars and the Hessians, and we had a little bit about the refugees. Uh, so this is just a description that goes with the militiamen and their equipment. So you get a sense of what it was all about. The militia were volunteers in each county, usually ranging from ages 16 to 50, who were able to bear arms and serve as needed. These volunteers were to form themselves into companies and choose by plurality of voices four persons among themselves, one captain, in our case, Captain Robert Nixon. So he was elected by the men that he led, two lieutenants and an ensign and uh, and an ensign, uh, and Middlesex County, New Jersey, was required to form two regiments of militia and six companies of Minutemen. Minutemen had precedence of rank over the common militia of the province, mainly because Minutemen had to be ready at any given time, whereas a regular militiaman, he might be on for a couple of weeks or a month, and then he'd be off, and then he'd be on and he'd flip-flop back and forth like that. So the minute when were more reliable. On October 28, 1775, men capable of bearing arms were now directed to enroll themselves. They were ordered to furnish themselves with a good musket or firelock and bayonet, sword or tomahawk, a steel ramrod, a worm, priming wire, and brush fitted thereto. A cartouche box, to contain 23 rounds of cartridges, 12 flints, and a knapsack. Now notice that they had to provide all this, not the, uh, the Congress. Uh, they were ordered to keep at their respective abodes one pound of powder and three pounds of bullets. Companies of light horse were ordered to be raised among the militia. And we're zeroing in on the company of light horse which was technically stationed in Cranberry at the time. A battalion consisting of four companies from Middlesex and four from Monmouth was created. There were three regiments. The third regiment was under command of Colonel John Deutschink. Captain Robert Nixon commanded the troop of light horse under Deutschink. Uh, this Deutschink fellow later uh, deserted to the other side. Okay, Randy, we're ready for pictures of Cranberry? Yeah, this one is called Cranberry into Cranberry I Road and uh, as a picture of the field in Cranberry. Excellent. Okay, now you may not know, but Cranberry was originally spelled C-R-A-N-B-E-R-R-Y. And uh, later it was uh, changed to Cranberry with the B-U-R-Y ending. Uh, it is, of course, located on the banks of the Cranberry River, also known as the Cranberry Creek or Brook. It's close to where George's Road, named after George Riskerick, who had a tavern in Cranberry, and Lowry's Road, uh, named after a governor of uh, the Jerseys when it was uh, East and West Jersey, uh, where they intersected. This stream is a tributary of the Millstone River. The name may have been derived from the Scottish craneberry, which associates the stem of the fruit with the neck of a crane. Over time, the E was dropped. Such berries were found in the low meadows associated with the brook. The current name translates into the borough of the crane. The first settlers established residences and businesses near the first mill of, by the stream before 1700. By the 1770s, this little village consisted of around 15 houses and 10 business establishments. 
Perhaps 200 people lived in around the town at the time. Uh, this out-of-the-way place was a strong bastion of patriot sentiment from the start. Many of its residents were members of the town's Presbyterian church. In the first year of the war, the townsfolk witnessed the movement of British and Hessian forces marching through and advancing to outposts along the Delaware River. Actually, at one time, when the British were advancing and got to Trenton, they had a... Um, horse troop stationed in Cranberry, a British horse troop. Uh, that cleared out when Cornwallis came back uh, following after the Battle of Princeton and headed towards New Brunswick. Then those guys pulled out of Cranberry, and that's when the American uh, militia group under Nixon came into Cranberry and made it their headquarters. They also beheld the retreat of these forces in the next year. That would bring us up to 1777. In between, they hosted some of Cadwallader's scouts who had intentions of launching an attack on New Brunswick from here. Since Cranberry lay along a major lower road route between New Brunswick and Trenton, which was connected to a larger network of roads between New York and Philadelphia, many wartime travelers passed through. There were occasional spies, and there were Tories, some of whom might have been refugees intent on getting behind enemy lines. It was in Cranberry that Nixon established his post headquarters for his horse troop. Okay? And so that gives you an idea of the role that Cranberry plays in this uh, event. Okay, Cran uh, we're ready for the next uh, one, the Cranberry Inn? Uh, yeah, I have a picture of the Cranberry Inn up right now. Okay, great, perfect. We, we're in sync here. This is good. Okay, this uh, inn was operated by Richard Hanley at the time. Uh, it is sort of associated with Rickerick's Tavern, but it's not really exactly the same place. They're, they're close by each other. I think one was behind the other, uh, and the newer one was the one in front of it. He was a respected townsman who would later become an officer of high rank. Nixon and his men admired Handley and frequently met at this Patriot's place. The inn was adjacent to the house of Peter and Hannah Perrine. Now there's a, a South Brunswick name for you. And set back from the location of the present day Cranberry Inn. So that might give you a, uh, a picture of, of what that uh, was. Okay, now before we go to the next one, Randy, we have to have our next vocabulary word. Okay. Okay, this is like taking medicine during the COVID virus. Uh, we have to take many doses here to get through this. Okay, the second term is dragoon. Dragoon. You need to Alfred. spell it and then give a definition. Give your first name and then say it. If you're Alfred. Alfred. D-R-A-G-O-O-N. Okay, and what is a dragoon? So, horse soldier. It's a horse soldier, okay. Uh, and, and it's a horse, he's a horse soldier who carries a firearm. But you get the full point, Alfred, good. Okay, so now we have a tie between Terry and Alfred. And Randy, we're ready for George's Road? Yeah, the next one I have up is... Uh house along George's Road. Okay, see, we're zeroing in on where this skirmish is going to take place, and I want to give you enough background so that you feel comfortable uh, understanding the skirmish. Uh, George's Road was the main wagon, wagon road from Cranberry to New Brunswick. It was named after George Riscarrick, not King George, as is commonly thought. Notice the date here. In 1686, George Riscarrick secured a warrant to survey 300 acres to conduct a house of entertainment for strangers and travelers on the Great Post Road at Cranberry Brook and Millstone. The Great Pro Post Road was a, a later name uh, for uh, this, this road because it was part of the complex uh, that connected the two capitals, East and West Jersey. 
Uh, over time, folks visiting uh, his popular tavern, which carried his last name, Ruskerik's Tavern, applied his first name to the former Indian path uh, that led there. This road traces an old Native American pathway once called the Cross Wixon Trail. Parts of old George's or George's Road still exist today. There is a distant connection between the man whom the road was named after and Captain Robert Nixon. George and Mary Mutie Riskerick, who ran the inn, had a son also named George. He ran the family's 400-acre farm in the Heights Town East Windsor area. This George had a daughter named Mary, who was the mother of Riskerick Moore, a private in Nixon's company at the time of the skirmish. So there's some coincidence in history. Okay, uh, I think we're ready for the next one, Randy. Okay, the next one up is the Battle of Trenton. Yeah, now this is a review uh, 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 be, before uh, this uh, skirmish that we're concentrating on, just, just to give you some background. Um, of course, George Washington's victories at Trenton and Princeton were a big deal. Uh, probably the first major turning point uh, in the, uh, uh, the war. Uh, the British garrisons suddenly withdrew their support from many of the state's loyalists early in the new year, after the battles of uh, the two battles of Trenton and the Battle of Princeton. Unwilling to continue his offensive in the bitter winter weather and stung by Washington's brilliant victories over the Hessians at Trenton on December 26, 1776, and over Cornwallis uh, at the Second Battle of Trenton and then the one in Princeton, on January 3rd, 1777, General Howe relinquished all the territory he had gained in New Jersey except Perth Amboy and New Brunswick. So what you're seeing now and setting the scene is the British are concentrated in New Brunswick and the American forces have taken over Princeton. And so in between becomes sort of a no man's land. Uh, suitable because of all the farming that's going on for raiding, raiding by various forces. Uh, one of those forces would be regulars and Hessians coming out of New Brunswick and heading south looking for stuff to get through the uh, rest of the winter and early spring uh, because they needed for, uh, sources uh, of food, et cetera, et cetera, horses, equipment, and uh, so this area was a possible area for them to raid, meaning South Brunswick. At the local level, the Loyalist uprisings in the second half of 1776 had, for the most part, been dealt with. One hotbed of insurgency that continued to boil was in Upper Freehold. It is from this region that refugees stirred up trouble in neighboring communities, such as in the South County of Middlesex, and that would include us. So what we're leading to is either regulars and Hessians coming out of New Brunswick and raiding our area or refugees coming up from Monmouth County and getting into our area. Okay, Randy, we're ready for the next one? Well, the next one I just have um, this William Laird and uh, you're going to do a, a quick bio on him or should we, should we skip that? Uh, I have Laird in there. You could do it early. Um, is, is that what you have? You have you're showing it's, something on Laird? Yeah, it's really just showing a picture picture of uh, Applejack and Rose's Grenadine. But you know, it's just a connection between Laird's uh, Applejack and William Laird. Right. Well, William Laird was uh, he joined Nixon's troop uh, in February, beginning of February. Uh, he is listed as a private in Nixon's Horse of Troop. And uh, a Richard Laird, probably William's brother, is also listed as being in the outfit. But it's not clear whether Richard was here at the time of the skirmish. It appears that William Laird served under Nixon in April. Uh, so if he served between February and April, then he was most likely involved in the skirmish. 
Laird hailed from English town originally. He was he was married to a daughter of James English, the founder of the town named after him. Census records of 1778-1780 show a William Laird living in free in the freehold area of Monmouth County. And there you have the the uh, I believe the area where you find the Laird uh, Brewery, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's what, that's all I have on Laird, and that gets us up to oh okay we're almost up to the next one for the competition. Okay. Uh, well, I have to I have to go through the uh, the uh, militia men who fought under uh, Nixon. That's what I have up next, Nixon's Militiamen. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to start with William Lloyd. He was born in 1757 in Upper Freehold, Monmouth County, and that was a hotbed for loyalists, by the way. Uh, at age 19, he began his militia experience in the summer of 76, either in July or August. So he's a veteran by the time the skirmish comes around, and... Uh, uh, under Nixon, and uh, he also uh, has experience with uh, the loyalists from where where he uh, grew up. Okay, next one I have is Richard Bainbridge. Uh, this man is listed in the muster roll of, of uh, the horse company as being discharged in, on April 1st. So that means he had served uh, during March. Uh, this document indicates that Bain Bainbridge began his service on February 3rd, and uh, so therefore uh, he is a likely candidate to have participated in the skirmish. Uh, the next one is Obadiah Harper. He served in, under Nixon from January to April 1st, and uh, his nickname was Harp. Uh, if you want to check on uh, some of these uh, 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 militiamen, uh, one of the best things to do is check the pension applications. This is where I got a lot of information on these guys. The next one is Gershom Lott. Uh, he started his service in, on February 21st. He was discharged April 1st. He's probably related to Daniel Lott, who served as cornet. Uh, and in those days, it also meant the ensign in Nixon's troop of horse. Uh, Stephen Dean is mentioned on Nixon's muster roll being discharged April 1st also. He's uh, the uh, lieutenant or uh, one of the lieutenants in the troop of horse. So he would be second in command under Nixon. Uh, and Dean assumed his second in command position on January 27th. And that Stephen Dean is most likely related to the deans of uh, South Brunswick. Uh, then I have Daniel Lott. He's listed as Nixon's cornet uh, uh, and discharged on April 1st. He appears to have served in the Middlesex County uh, Company of Horse uh, since January 27th. Uh, cornet was the lowest grade of commissioned officer in a cavalry troop below captain and lieutenant. He, uh, as Cornette, he carried the troop standard, but I have no evidence that Nixon had a standard. Uh, 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 so uh, that that is something that still needs to be explored. Okay. Um, he is most likely the brother of Gershom Lott. Um, and, of course, we're talking about uh, people from the South Ward of Middlesex County. Uh, there was also a Peter Lott who served under Nixon, and he was probably related. Okay, and uh, also I have the name of Lott's horse. It was called Arabian. Uh, just a minor little side note there. Uh, next man is Charles Fisher. Uh, he also did the thing of uh, 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 starting his term of service February 17th and finishing up April 1st. Uh, he uh, also held the rank of sergeant. Uh, he uh, also, in his pension application, uh, he gave an account. He said a company of horse was then and there raised by direction of General Washington to serve only until the British should quit New Brunswick. 
and to prevent them and refugees from plundering the inhabitants. This company was commanded by Captain Robert Nixon. So he gives a hint of the participation in the skirmish that we're talking about. Uh, Peter Job or Jobs uh, is listed among the men. Again, he was discharged April 1st. Uh, his name on the document uh, that I research is Peter Job, J-O-B. And of course, we have, dis have discussed this before about the different spellings of the last name. Um, he's a private. Uh, in the, the uh, Troop of Horse, and uh, he, uh, he gives an account of uh, uh, what the type of work that they did, uh, and he refers to the group as Light Dragoons. Uh, Riskeric Moore, uh, well, and I mentioned that name before, he was also in the uh, Troop of Horse, and uh, he, he mentions that he was stationed in Cranberry and uh, uh, had served uh, scouting the countryside. Um, and uh, he was born in 1755, and uh, there is a monument and plaque in the Presbyterian Church Cemetery in Cranberry uh, with his name on it. Uh, he was single at the time of the skirmish and hailed from East Windsor. His great-grandfather was George Riskerik, uh, the one whose name is on George's road. Okay, I have John Barraclough. There's another good South Brunswick name. Uh, he was a uh, private under Nixon and served at this time. Uh, Nixon's quartermaster was John Van Kirk, uh, and uh, he served at this time. Uh, Peter Sutton, uh, he joined in January, and he appears on the payrolls for three months of service. So that would uh, also cover the skirmish in March. Uh, James Siegand uh, was in Nixon's company, and uh, he, uh, he is, uh, he, uh, in his pension, he offers the most convincing source uh, for the participation in the skirmish on March 12th. And uh, his testimony sort of pinpoints uh, some other uh, names of people who were there. David Rhea, uh, or actually pronounced Ray, uh, is also a member of the uh, troop at this time. And uh, for a time, he served as a cornet. Okay. Now, Randy, that finishes uh, the known people that were in uh, Nixon's company. And my guess was there were about 20 men altogether uh, uh, in his company for this skirmish. And, Randy, that leads us into our third uh, term for the uh, competition. Are you ready? Yep, ready to go. Okay, the term is lobster back. <clears throat> Dave here. Oh, Dave here. Lobsterback. Dave here. Who is it? Uh, Dave. Dave? Uh, yeah, lobsterback. Yeah. L O B S T E R B A C K. Excellent. Yeah. Lobsterback. You got it spelled right. And what or who is a lobsterback? Uh, the, the British, because the red coats. Okay, good. A British regular. You have a point. We now have a three-way tie. Okay, number four term is really going to separate the uh, pros from the rookies. Okay, Randy, are we ready for the next one? Yeah, the next one I have, I don't know if you want to use it for tonight. It's an eye for an eye or a Lex uh, Talonis from Hammer Abbey's Code. Code? Yeah, Lex, Lex Talionis. Yeah. Talionis, uh, okay. Now, it, uh, go ahead. You show what you have there, and I'll explain it. Uh, be, uh, this is really quite interesting. And another reason that inspired me to uh, write the captain's rule the way that I did. Um, captain Robert Nixon was a tough guy. Uh, he was admired by his men, and one of the reasons they admired him was for his toughness. Now, one of the ways that a uh, militiaman uh, in those days could be tough was by exercising a thing called lex talionis. 
and that's the old ancient law of retaliation. We know it today from the uh, biblical phrase, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And what it basically means is that if somebody does something to you in a criminal or nasty way, you have the right to take revenge in an equally nasty way. If you can't do it literally the same, then you could do it uh, something like it, okay? And uh, so if somebody steals something from you, you can go and steal it back and then steal something from the person who stole it from you. Uh, that would be an example, uh, and, and in these, this day and age, we call it taking the law into your own hands and carrying it to the extreme. Now, uh, Nixon wa was supposed to have a personality like this. There was somebody who was much worse than him down in Monmouth County, and that was Black Dave. And uh, uh, it's interesting that our winner of our last point is also named Dave. But Black Dave was a nasty guy. And the refugees and the loyalists and the Tories uh, gave him that nickname, Black Dave. Anyway, uh, Nixon uh, carried out uh, this Lex Talionis. And this goes back to Roman times. This, this is just a term that the Romans used for it. Uh, basically, in the time of the Revolutionary War, it's coming from the Scottish and the Irish, in other words, the Celtic culture. The Celtic culture had something uh, where somebody within a clan who is offended or attacked or whatever, they can take revenge in a like manner. And so that's also involved in this Lex Talionis and gives it a uh, more Northern European flavor. Okay. Randy, are you all set? Yeah, yeah. The next up I have the Battle of Princeton. Does that line up with what you were talking about? Uh, let's see. No, not exactly. How about Kirk? I have uh, John Van Kirk who was a quartermaster in Nixon's company. Uh, yeah, but we finished with those. Okay, so after that, we had we talked about Sutton. See, see, some of it got out of uh, sync because it was for from the first time we presented. I have Allentown, New Jersey, and Tory. Yeah, right. Okay. You're, you're on Allentown? track now. Okay. Right, right. Allentown. Now, uh, back in the day, Allentown was called Allen's Town, uh, uh, named after a person uh, in the area. And uh, uh, Nixon is going to have to go all the way down there after the skirmish because he's chasing after the people he thinks uh, they were fighting uh, while the skirmish was going on in South Brunswick. Um, and uh, the, th the key to Allenstown uh, for the Patriots is that's the location of the nearest Patriot magazine. In other words, where they stored their ammunition and, their, and, and some of their weaponry. And George Washington considered this place far enough away from the enemy, meaning far enough away from New Brunswick, at the time uh, to, uh, to keep it going. Uh, however, the magazine was raided many times by the refugees from the upper freehold area. And uh, uh, they, they were finally repulsed and the Supply Post uh, ma uh, magazine was restored. Okay, uh, now we're ready for, uh, uh, do you have a picture of Tory activists? Yeah, Tories and Loyalists. Okay, good. Uh, uh, one of the bands uh, uh, was called uh, the Skinner Rogues, and that, that has a double meaning. Uh, <clears throat> and Nixon uh, knew very well about uh, the Skinner Rogues. Um, he's, uh, the, uh, they, were, they were Tory outlaws, uh, loyal to the king, uh, and uh, the reason they got their name Skinner was because they used to uh, strip uh, people of their possessions. And uh, this uh, included what they were wearing, uh, because these, 
uh, Tories who were hiding out in the woods, they needed everything. They needed clothing, they needed food, they needed ammunition, they needed uh, weapons. And so they would steal almost anything in order to survive uh, in, in the piney woods and, and, and the swamp areas of, of New Jersey. Okay, uh, he's also referring to a Colonel Cortland Skinner uh, who was appointed by William Howe to organize provincial troops in New Jersey. So Skinner was one of the primary leaders of uh, uh, what became the refugees. By the middle of 1777, Skinner had recruited 500 men, and these were called Skinner's Greens uh, because they preferred to wear uh, uh, the green color for their uniforms. Uh, and uh, many of the people that he uh, recruited were actually pine robbers uh, who were thugs and thieves and so forth and really nasty characters, uh, not people that you'd want to invite to a, uh, a cocktail party. Okay, uh, Randy, the next one, um, I believe you're, you're going on to the Pine Barrens and the robbers? Yeah, yep, Pine Barrens is next. Okay. The loyalists who took up the lifestyle of the pine robbers, also called the piners, uh, and alludes to their hiding places. Uh, such Tory irregulars use the pine forests and cedar swamps as bases of operation, safe havens, and secret locations for spoils gained by raids on vulnerable local citizens. Usually these refugees operated in their own neighborhoods. <clears throat> taking advantage of knowledge of familiar terrain and relying on friends and kin to carry out their raids and help to keep them from being apprehended. They succeeded best where local militia found it difficult to police sprawling, sparsely populated townships, such as the ones found in the South Ward of Middlesex County. Uh, that would include us, and uh, therefore we were ripe for attack by these people. Uh, and more so in uh, Monmouth County, especially around Upper Freehold. The area of the Pine Barrens in the 18th century stretched from here to the south, encompassing most of southern New Jersey. This subregion, sparsely populated by folks who just wanted to be left alone, developed a less than desirable reputation long before the war broke out. It was referred to as the Wild Woods, Place of Heathen towering retreat, nature stark naked. One of George Washington's top generals from New Jersey referred to the refugee lairs as where the unrestrained live. So they were getting uh, quite a nasty reputation. Uh, also uh, located in these areas were debtors, squatters, religious dissenters, uh, fishermen, who actually were into smuggling more than fishing, hunters and lumbermen. Uh, so uh, very uh, tough hombres in that area. Uh, okay, Randy, I think I'm all set on that. Do you have any more or are we finished? Well, it had. I just had the Dragoons up there. And then after that, um, Devil David, David Foreman. Oh, okay. Okay, he's, yeah, he's coming up. Um, okay. So uh, we got up to uh, 16 on my chart, so we're ready for the next term. Are we ready in the competition? Yep, ready to go. Okay. The term is padder. The term is padder. Um, Not with a T, but with another letter. Padder. Yeah. Who is a patter? Oh. Alfred, I'll guess. Alfred. B A T E R would be somebody's father, like paternal? No, remember I said not with a T. Not oh. with a T. Padder. Oh. Okay, try to spell it again since you're uh, on uh, up at bat. P A D E R. P -E A D E R. Very close, but no cigar. Oh, wow. Who's second? Who's next? This is Bill. P A D D E R. 
Bill, P-A-D-D-E-R is correct. And what's the definition, Bill? Uh, someone who uh, pads the, the material, you know, creates the, <laughs> creates the jackets and things. Yeah, it used. Yes, that might be for a disco uh, uh, today, but not back in the, during the Revolutionary War. So you get half a point. Uh, who wants to try the definition? Lucy? Lucy? Yeah. Someone who walks? Someone who walks. No, that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. You need somebody nastier than that. <clears throat> okay, one more try. Who wants to try? This who is, is a patter? This is Marty. Marty. The person who puts the wadding in for the cannon. A uh, very good military attempt uh, at defining it, but incorrect. <laughs> okay, I will uh, 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 inform you as to what the definition is. A patter, P-A-D-D-E-R, is a highway robber, a highwayman. Okay. Now, uh, we move on. Randy, where are you up to? Well, we could Carol, go the dragoon? The, the dragoons would be next, yeah. Okay. Now, um, uh, a dragoon uh, is the official term in the European sense. So, in other words, the British uh, would call their mounted horse troops not cavalry, but they call them dragoons. Uh, Nixon sometimes referred to his men as dragoons. Now, there's two types of dragoons. There's the light dragoon and there's the heavy dragoon. The heavy dragoon gets the term dragoon. The light dragoon is, is always known as the light dragoon. So, uh, then you need to know the difference between the two. Uh, the heavy dragoon is the one who dismounted upon reaching a battle after traveling on horse to get there and then fights on foot. Uh, those were the dragoons that were heavily uh, or greatly successful against um, uh, um, uh, Mercer, uh, General Hugh Mercer in the Battle of Princeton at the very beginning of the battle uh, because they got there by horseback, then they dismounted, they hid behind some uh, hill, uh, hilly rampart area, fence, and then they fired on, uh, 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 they fired on the American troops who were first at the battle scene of the Battle of Princeton. Okay, uh, and so uh, when Nixon refers to dragoons, uh, he's talking about light dragoons, okay? Uh, the irony in the skirmish is that they do dismount in order to fight the skirmish. Okay, we're on to the next one, Randy. Next one I have is uh, David Foreman, Devil David. Okay, now this, uh, I'm, I'm saying this, that he's the inspiration for Nixon. Nixon looks up to this guy, so we need a little background on him. Uh, m uh, Militia Brigadier General David Foreman uh, was uh, uh, the main guy against the Monmouth Tories. And he far surpassed anything done by other militia leaders. Foreman was also called Black David because of his swarthy complexion, and he was also called Devil David by those who feared his wrath or were awed by his questionable actions against the enemy. Many of his deeds were performed outside the law, and this is where Lex Talionis uh, comes in, and done in the name of revenge for atrocities committed by loyalists. By taking measures that were uh, uh, unapproved by his superiors, Foreman became the chief intimidator of the refugees in the region. That would also include our region, too. Later in the war, he led this, uh, uh, this uh, effort as chairman of the Secretive Committee of Nine, which directed activities of the Monmouth Association for Retaliation. As chairman of the retaliators, 
form an either directed, determined, or in the background, counseled, aided, encouraged, supported, and controlled the little patriot bands that in scavenger packs hunted with dogs. Okay, and they hunted down uh, what were called the malefactors. Lloyd's mention of Devil Dave indicates some association between Nixon's troop of horse and Foreman's machinations in the neighboring county. The Middlesex men held this fearless, energetic, and well-spoken leader and his questionable methods in high esteem. Now, a lot of these actions done by Foreman and Nixon were not reported. And uh, that's one important reason that uh, to get a hold of Nixon's diary, because it might have some accounts of uh, what measures they took to deal with the enemy. Uh, but we don't have it, so we don't know. So a lot of this stuff has been lost to history as to what, what atrocities were committed on both sides. Okay. Uh, what do you have next, Randy? Well, I have about the pine robbers, but you had already talked about them, about being uh, criminal gangs, marauders, British sympathizers. Right, right, right. And we can skip that. Uh, yeah, and we then... build up to the excitement of the skirmish. Uh, <laughs> okay. So... okay. Go ahead. Yeah, well, tell me what you have next. Well, I have about John Bacon, one of the Pine, pine Robbers, um, and the Cedar Bridge Tavern. So that's what I was, you know, I, I have it labeled here. It's uh, the, one of the last skirmishes um, in, the, uh, in the war. And, um, okay, so, yeah, and you wanted to talk about that a little bit, right? Well, yeah, um, so I have the picture up here, and this is still, the this tavern is still there today, and they have um, reenactments on the 27th of December, so you actually can go down there, and I'm going to send everyone now uh, some information about the reenactments that happened in December, like the uh, 10 crucial days in Trenton, and also this is going to be happening in Ocean County. So um, yeah, it was a, it was one of the last skirmishes that happened during the during the war uh, in December of 1782. And it's called the Affair at Cedar Bridge. Yep, and it's held every year. So and I'll send out more information on that. But that's uh, I just wanted to mention that. But you can uh, you can continue from here. Ed. Okay. Okay. Good. And uh, now that this leads us up to uh, uh, the next one for the competition. So that's a good segue. Okay. Um, the next word, this is also a tough one. Uh, this does not contain T in it, the letter T. The term is nidderling. Nidderling. Who wants to spell it? Randy, do we have anybody to spell it? Um, no, no one's said anything about that one yet. We have to be courageous here. Remember, we're <laughs> fighting against the British. Can you pronounce it have again? Because cowards. it's hard. It's hard to hear over the phone. Okay, let me try it again. The word is nidderling. Nidderling. Can you spell that, please? <laughs> Good try. You can't you can't trick me. The word is nitterling. Who is a nitterling? Terry? Terry, give it a try, Terry. Someone who's weak and cowardly? Excellent. Excellent. But you didn't spell it. Oh, I let me start off. N I D D E R L I N G, Nitterling. Perfect, perfect. You take the lead with that. Nitterling, a base coward back in the day. Uh, we could use that term today for some people, but we don't. Okay, Randy, uh, what do you have next? Um, next, I have British regulars and Hessians, but I don't know if you want okay. to use that or move on. Yeah, yeah, we, we can use that. Uh, okay. The main reason is this. There are some historians who say that the people who came to South Brunswick that were involved in the skirmish were British regulars and possibly Hessians coming out of New Brunswick. 
But of course, they base that on speculation. They have no proof. And uh, obviously, they would come out of New Brunswick coming down George's Road. Now, the danger in regulars and Hessians coming all the way out of New Brunswick to go into South Brunswick to get, in this case, cattle was very dangerous uh, because there were militia groups around and <coughs> the road, the King's Highway, and George's Road was protected. Uh, and, and so it's highly unlikely that it was British regulars who came foraging this far out. Uh, remember, this happens in March, and this is the end of the winter uh, before the start of the spring. And so supplies are running very low, and people are getting desperate. Uh, now, uh, anybody who takes things, raids things here, if it's refugees doing it, they might just take the cattle into New Brunswick. Uh, but another place that they might take them is to Sandy Hook. Uh, and, and get the supplies shipped over to uh, uh, New York or Perth Amboy, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so there are possibilities here, but the one that I opt for is the refugees coming from uh, Monmouth County. Okay, we're ready for the next one, Randy. Okay, the next one I had the Whitlock Tavern in Dayton. Yeah. Right, because now we're talking about crossroads, which would be the closest community to where the skirmish took place. And we know that Crossroads was the original name of what we know now as Dayton, okay? And uh, the Crossroads that you're referring to is George's Road, which was the Cross Weeks and Indian Trail originally, and Longbridge Road, which is now, which is now Ridge Road. They intersected where there were two taverns, the Whitlock Inn, later known as the Barraclo Tavern. James Whitlock built his inn in 1732, later sold it to the Barraclos. Across the street, where Wawa is now, uh, Wawa will in the future in 150 years be a historical site on its own. <laughs> Thomas Wetherill uh, and his father and also with the help of John Wetherill, built the Wetherill Tavern. And uh, that uh, turned into the Wines Hotel, uh, which you may or may not know about. So at this crossroads, uh, this is where uh, the locals would gather, uh, exchange news, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, uh, get caught up on the events that are going around. Okay, uh, now next you have uh, about the Weatherall House. Yeah, next up is the Weatherall House. And okay. we, we just had our scavenger hunt, right? <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, John Weatherall, one of the wealthiest and most influential men in the area at the time, uh, he was on the old side at this time, uh, but he was a victim of um, uh, loss of... Uh, 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 materials and uh, possessions, uh, and he laid claim to them, and uh, included in that was most likely some cattle. And uh, th those, that's an official document uh, that, that you can view, the, the claims by the locals uh, of losses that they suffered during the American Revolution. Uh, he uh, assumed the title of Colonel of the 2nd Regiment of the Militia at the beginning of the war. However, due to advanced age and health reasons, uh, he resigned August 1st, 1776. So he was no longer a military leader when the skirmish occurred, most likely on his property. Uh, before the war, Wetherill had served as a member of the New Jersey Colonial Assembly, he was elected in 1749 and served in this capacity until 1776. Okay, his plantation encompassed nearly 2,000 acres of land between Crossroads and Cranberry. He was a patriot who served the cause as a member of the Standing Committee of Correspondence and Inquiry, and he was a member of the Provincial Congress in 1775 and 1776. Now, he was important enough a leader to have a bounty on his head. 
and the British wanted him dead or alive. Okay, Randy, we all set on that? Yeah, the next one up is Monmouth Junction. I just have a picture of a rural Monmouth Junction here, a barn in a field. Okay, okay yeah, and I just wanted to mention that uh, the Lawrence family farm, uh, which took up most of what we know now as Monmouth Junction, uh, was a historical landmark in its own right. Uh, and the key here is that there are horses uh, being raised on this farm uh, that refugees, the British, the Hessians, anybody would love to get a hold of. And um, one of the horses, um, and do you have a picture of a, of a horse? Yeah, I have a picture of a stud horse up right now. Right. Well, this was a stud farm. Uh, the Lawrences are basically there in the summer. The rest of the year, the Wetherills were uh, running the farm uh, for them. And um, they uh, provided a stud service. Uh, and the prized thoroughbred on the farm, the name of that horse was Bay Richmond. And Bay Richmond uh, was hidden by the colonists in the area whenever the enemy came around. Uh, because he was an extremely valuable horse. And there were people from miles around who used to bring their mares uh, for stud service involving Bay Richmond. Uh, just a little sidelight. Uh, uh, and, and, and the refugees, after they stole the cattle, could have been heading for uh, the uh, Lawrence farm. Okay. Okay. Um, then I have a uh, mention of the slaves uh, uh, in the area. I, yeah. Do you have any picture for that? Yeah, I have a picture of, uh, it's, his, it's entitled Enslaved People in New Jersey, and it has uh, people actually on auction. Okay. Now, the reason that we should bring this up is that the refugees were quite successful in getting slaves to run away and join them uh, and, and join the loyalist side. And the Longbridge Farm, uh, they estimate that they had over 40 slaves. So this would have been an ideal place for uh, refugees or the British to try to get uh, slaves to uh, come over to their side. And um, there are actual accounts. Uh, John Wetherill complained about uh, the partying that was going on uh, when the slaves had uh, social gatherings at the Longbridge Farm. Uh, so that's documented, and, and you can check that out in the uh, history room at, at the library. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that because that was a potential if uh, the enemy had won the skirmish and had moved on in the area. This might have been uh, one of the things that they tried to do. And uh, then as far as I think the next one you have is, is about... Uh, uh, the Native Americans? Yeah, the chief of the Lenape. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I have Chief Wickwalla. And uh, one of the things in our area, uh, there used to be Native Americans in the area, but they're, they're basically gone from the area by the time of the skirmish. Uh, but there were stories around, and uh, one of them was the story of Wickwalla's ghost. And he was a chief. Uh, his uh, group was uh, 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 so associated with Manalapan Brook, and he killed a European, a Captain John Leonard, and uh, they uh, found him guilty and hung him. And uh, uh, there were lots of stories about his ghost haunting the area, uh, such as uh, where the crossroads is, George's Road, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, the next one, Randy, is uh, Half Acre. Yes, next one's um, Half Acre Road, and I have a picture of a tavern. Okay, now, the refugees that are coming up into uh, South Brunswick for this skirmish, they most likely pass through an area called the Devil's Half Acre. And uh, th there is a road uh, that you can travel on called Half Acre Road. And there was a tavern there uh, back in the Revolutionary War times, and the owner of the tavern uh, had a fenced-in area in the back 
where they would have uh, a uh, no holds bar fighting going on, and they would have gamblers come and bet on the fighters who were there. And I have that in the story of the captain's rule, and I have Captain Nixon having to fight at uh, the Devil's Half Acre. But the nasty people coming into South Brunswick probably passed through this area uh, and and uh, uh, headed in, into uh, the South Brunswick uh, George's Road area for that skirmish. Okay, Randy, I think we're ready for the skirmish. Okay. And uh, so we're approaching the end, uh, but I want to throw in another term. Terry has the lead. She's leading two to one to one to a half. Okay, so here's the next term. This is a hyphenated term. Ding boy. Ding boy. Bill. B-I-N-G hyphen B-O-Y. Right. You get the spelling correct. And Bill, what does it mean? Oh, my Google's down. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who is a ding boy? Dave here, is he an orderly of sorts? No, that's incorrect. Anybody want to try the definition for ding boy? A ding boy would be a rogue, a Hector, or a bully. Excellent. Who is this? Oh, Terry. Terry again. All right, Terry, you're on the money. Okay, yes, a ding boy is a bully, a rogue, a nasty person. Okay, now what I'm going to do is read the skirmish account that comes through somebody's diary, not Nixon's diary, but one of the men under him. And uh, in this account are some of the vocabulary terms that you have been struggling over. Okay. Randy, here we go. Okay. The skirmish. Let me put up the volume a little bit. Okay. The rain clouds was showing a measure of mercy as we galloped up George's rutted road to the bend, where Colonel John's slaves claimed to see Redcoats parade. I couldn't believe it, and neither could Rob in the lead. Prodden the forehorse through deepening mud, and the ensign with ten dragoon privates closing behind. What crossed me mind was ones less than lobster backs, late for yesterday's fare and just cutting through to pester the taverns on a way on the way to Brunswick Town. Mayhaps it was Wetherill's kind and stores they hoped to seize and the good old man himself, for the colonel was at home, unsuspecting in bed. Mayhaps these patters meant to reach Lawrence's farm, where prized Arabians was hid in stalls, and too many slaves was wanting freedom's taste. What else was there to steal round crossroads that was worth a chance of gaining for the king? And what a price to pay daring to face Rob's wrath. Our captain raised his Queen Anne sword and raised, reined his mare to sudden halt before the bend. So he closed round to catch his words, hurled against the wind. I've a mind to think it is refugees what was seen. The kind ain't fit to live or fight by proper rules. If they're found ahead, we'll cut them down like trees. But if they be true regulars, ready for a red day's worst. With that, he ordered me and more to hurry on ahead to find what kind of foe old fate held in store. And that we did in the windy cold and drizzling mist. For just beyond the Wetherill Plantation Road, by orchard trees, the cattle thieves hove in sight. 
They seen us too, those ten or more rogues I'd estimate, and the close one leaped from his horse, stood in the ooze, and fired his musket though we was out of range. They was not redcoats, nor brass cap hessians, blue or green, but mere bedraggled nitterlands who stolen cows to drove. They haps on the way to Brunswick town by using George's road. We did not reply with musket fire or pistol shot. Instead, we turned back with speed that matched the way we came and reported what we seen of cowboys and their game. Under a sputtering torch held high by Ensign Danny Lott, the captain listened quick to us and boasted he was right. Damn thieving refugees must have crossed the county line. Veins upon his head's bulged thick and he spit in flames. Time for anointing the hides of our uninvited guests. My good de 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 dragoons of Middlesex, let's drive them back to hell. Good Colonel John, still in his sleep robe, held lantern in hand, under his chestnut, flanked by furs near to the road. At his back was his foreman, with five stout slaves, all pointing their weapons where thieves had gone. The codger cried out as wind and dragoon sped on by. Prize cows have been snatched by some ding-boy gang. Catch all those rascals and bring them to me. But such words was lost in the racket and race up the road. Leastways we knew poor John was safe, though embarrassed. As our steed sloshed up the road to save his pride, it didn't take long to find our foe priming muskets behind a drove in thickets beside a difficult way. Our captain had us halt just out of range, then he split us in two for a creep in the woods, which we did in muck and mire round the feet of trees, for to corner these grim, ructuous men. The tanner had picked the best of us to face haughty pillagers come to test our fame. The rest of ours was with young Ensign Lot, creeping bout, and round to the enemy's rear. Our best chance was served by permitting no way of escape than closing like cats at the pounce. Keen-eyed was us in this horrible dark, with weapons prime for a bicker of lead. But sooner than thought, other guns was spitting fire, with shots spent on wisely on branches or patriot heads. "'Twas then that the captain ordered bullets rammed home "'to shoot when we charged out from the woods. "'We volleyed with rage as we raced out to the road, "'sparing the cattle but finding the brush. "'Chaos commenced with the beasts fleeing both ways "'while their captors were slipping the sack "'on horse or on foot. "'Late was the ensign in finding the road, "'for the pond marsh had soaked his men through.' and slowed him enough to allow these slick land rats to slip a ways north and east to the swamp. Back down the road to our horses we sped, <coughs> mounted them fast to assume needed task, of rounded up condiddled co cows and searching for cowards, who left not a trace, saved a blank in the mud. The reason I say blank at the end is because that's one of the words that you need to know how to spell and define. Okay, Randy, that concludes the description of the skirmish. Okay. And uh, what do you have next to show? Well, we have uh, musket fire, the red watch, stolen cattle, upper freehold, in ways town. <laughs> I don't know. Where do you want to, you want to pick it up? Because, you know, I was okay. thinking we should, we should get some point, we should go towards the, um, the Pigeon Swamp and, and you know, to, to, right, um, right. to finish up there. That's where in the account, uh, the uh, cattle rustlers are headed uh, to the Pigeon Swamp. So uh, now, okay, now before you get to the Pigeon Swamp, let me give a vocabulary word in here because okay. we're coming to the end of that too. Okay. Okay, now you heard some of these terms in the uh, account. But I didn't spell them, and I really didn't define what they were. So you still have that uh, job to do. Okay, the next uh, term is ructuous. Ructuous.
Remember to give your first name, then spell it, and then define it. Ructuous. Tracy. Tracy. Go ahead, Tracy. I'll give it a try. Ructuous? Yes, so Ructuous. I'm thinking R-U-C-T-U-O-U-S. Perfect. You have Woo. a half a point. Woo. Ructuous. Wow. Now, Tracy, can you t define the word? I think, you know, I think ruckus. So maybe um, ructuous is uh, like it's a it was a it was a ruckus. Maybe uh, uh, boisterous and chaotic. Okay, so think of a person who would do it. What type of person would that be? Oh, it's a person. Not well. It you could. It's an adjective. Right. So, but it it, it in this case it describes a person, a ructuous. Whatever. So like a disruptive person. Excellent. Okay, that's good enough. Quarrelsome, troublemaker, disruptive. You got it. You got a Woo! full point. Okay. <laughs> we have a competition here for sure. Okay, Randy, let's go into the swamp. Okay, let me uh, get there. Hold on a second. <laughs> here we are. Okay, we have a shot of the pigeon swamp in the wintertime. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Ah, I got the pigeon swamp right here. Okay. Um, what Nixon planned to do was uh, cover a long stretch of George's Road and then uh, get his men into the wild land that lay beyond Crossroads, what we know of as Pigeon Swamp. This was the most logical hiding place uh, for these refugees. Uh, the most common name uh, uh, from uh, the other than Pigeon Swamp is called the Great Swamp. Um, uh, the the uh, name most likely comes from Ann Pigeon. And of course, Randy, the oldest document we have in the uh, history room is that uh, Pigeon Swamp ledger, correct? Right. Right. So uh, uh, th this is uh, uh, a very important historical site for us. Um, Ann Pigeon was the daughter of Jeremiah Bass, who was once the governor of East Jersey. Uh, the other possible uh, uh, name for Pigeon Swamp comes from the passenger pigeons, which were wiped out by uh, hunters uh, back in the day. Uh, they were gone sometime, I believe, uh, in the late 18th. Uh, 1800s. Uh, so there's two possibilities for the name of it, but historians tend to uh, uh, favor the Ann Pigeon story. Uh, now, uh, Nixon searched as far as Saplin Ridge, and that's another term associated with uh, 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 the Pigeon Swamp. Uh, it was, it was uh, where the high ground is in Pigeon Swamp, and there's not much of that at all. Uh, and there was a plantation uh, called Sapling Ridge, and that's where that name comes from. It was near George's Road, and it was within 200 yards of the old Lawrence Mill. And that's the information I have on Pigeon Swamp, Randy. Okay. So what's okay. next? Okay. You want me to talk about the, the ledger, the Pigeon Swamp ledger, or do you have more, more to talk uh, well, about? Well, I have, I have some more vocabulary terms, and then I'm okay. finished. Okay. Uh, and then I would talk about the ledger. Okay. Sounds okay, good. Okay, so we, we can wrap this up. Okay, now this is a, 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 uh, an expression, so it's more than one word. It's easy to spell, uh, might be a little tricky as far as the definition, but I think you'll get it, and I'll call this an easy one. The expression is slipping the sack. Slipping the sack. Who wants to go first? Hey, this is Bill. I'll give it a rip. 
Bill, go ahead. Is, is a flipping like in F L I P P I N G flipping? The you, you are correct. Oh, right. And the second word is the. 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 <laughs> yeah. And the third word is SAC, S A C. S A C? Uh, let me see here. S A C K, maybe K. <laughs> Okay, you get a half a point for spelling. And now, what does it mean? Uh, rolling over in bed? No, it's not a marital term. Uh, you are incorrect. Uh, who wants to try the meaning? You get half a point, Bill. Uh, Dave here. Uh, it's uh, like dumping out a sack, like uh, tossing, tossing uh, to, to rob something. To empty out uh, it. I, I, th I think you got the right string wrong yo-yo. <laughs> Try it again. Slipping the sack. It refers to something a person would do. Can I guess? Go ahead, Dave. This, oh, this is Alfred. I'm going to say escaping. Yes, you got it. Alfred. Sorry, Dave. Alfred got it. It means to get away. Good luck, Alfred. <laughs> Alfred gets a half a point. Okay. Yay. Now, let me finish up here, Randy. I got two more. Okay. This is a tougher one, but it was used in the uh, 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 account that I read of the skirmish. The term is condiddle. One word. Condiddle. Spell it first after giving your name and then give me a definition. It is a verb. Condiddle. Hi, this is Bill. How about the C O N D I T T L E? And I don't have a clue. Uh, that is incorrect. There are no T's in condiddle. Oh, okay. Who is next? Uh, Dave here. Uh, well, Dave. C O N D I D D L E. D D L E is correct. And what does it mean? I'm going to guess that it means uh, being a con man or something like that. Uh, what type of con man? Uh, a thief. Uh, a thief. And so, in other words, as a verb, it means to steal. I'm going to give you a full point, Dave. Thanks. Because I'm a, a merciful man. Thank you. Okay, now the clue that was left behind by the refugees. Remember I said blank in the account of the skirmish. And Randy, you know this one very well. This is two words. Easy to spell, maybe hard to define. The term is red watch. What is a red watch? Bill, try R-E-D-W-A-T-C-H. Excellent spelling skills, Bill. How do you do it? <laughs> Very careful. OK. And what does it mean? Well, uh, how about a uh, uh, reading on what when you're on watch, you're watching out or you're a lookout for, um, you know, look, look out looking for the bad guys or for anything, really. Okay, that's a good try, but way off base. Uh, not Did even you get close half to a cigar? point. Oh, okay. Who's next to try to give the definition? Uh, Name, Dave, please. Would that have to do with uh, like a signal, signal fire or something like that? No. One more try. Who wants to give a try? Give it a shot, Alfred. It's probably, I'm going to say a century. It's a what? Century. Century. No, it is not. Nobody but gets it. A red watch back in Revolutionary War times was a gold watch. A gold watch. 
Now, Randy, I have to add up the points here to pick out our winner and our second place person, our runner-up person, while you're talking. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I wanted to, because you go ahead and tally, and I'll talk about uh, the Pigeons Swamp Ledger. Um, Right. I'm tallying right now. Okay. So the Swamp... You just go ahead and talk. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So the the Pigeon Swamp, the idea was that they wanted to drain it to make the ground, uh, the the land more arable so they could farm it. So they had to ask permission. So uh, the townspeople, the prominent townspeople like Terhune, uh, Gulick and Williamson Weatherall um, asked William Livingston, the first governor, permission to do it because there were still skirmishes happening at that time in 1779. So they put together a petition um, and asked if they were able to do this. And this is the petition. This is actually down in the state house from 1779. At the bottom, you can see Weatherall, Terhune, Gulick, and uh, Williamson down there. So that's the petition, and it did get passed, even though it was still wartime, there were still things going on. Um, This is a transcription that one of our um, people from the Historical Society did, um, um, Pat Romano. Um, But what it does, this is the Pigeon Swamp ledger. This, let me tell you a little bit about the ledger. Um, South, all of South Brunswick's early documents burned in a house fire on March 31st in 1843 at the home of Township Clerk Richard McDowell. So the Pigeon Swamp Ledger is the only uh, South Brunswick historic document that exists before 1843. So this is an important document and it was given to the library at some point in the 70s. And our uh, retired town historian, Seal Leadham, she read about it. She read that it was somewhere somewhere in the building, um, but didn't know exactly where it was. So she finally found it in a box. It was uh, in an old looking box too. So there's this 230 year old document that was there. And uh, through a grant, we were lucky enough to get it uh, conserved and digitized. And what you're looking at are some of the digitized uh, images from the Pigeon Swamp Ledger. And we now have it conserved so it will last even longer, even though it lasted all those years. Not, didn't make it a, didn't look too bad. But what's interesting about it is some of the payments here. If you have a, a good picture, you could read the names of the payments, but the thing that's interesting, I find right over here, is they were still making the payments in pounds. That's the symbol for pounds um, because they weren't on American currency yet. They were still using British pounds. So this document is, if anybody's interested in seeing, I, could, uh, I can sh- actually show you the, the digitized version. And if anybody wanted to come in one day, I can bring it out too and show you the real document. So it was, uh, it was around for, it's been around for over 230 some years and we're lucky enough to have it here and we got it conserved. So that is the Pigeon Swamp Ledger. And that's, uh, that's it for me. I just wanted to explain about one of the documents that we have here. And uh, Ed, how are you doing with the tallying? Uh, I, my math skills are not that good, but I was <laughs> able to total and tally. Okay. And we do have a winner, Randy. Okay. We do have a winner. Uh, Terry is the winner and so she gets choice of prize we also have a tie for second place between dave and bill so our winners tonight are terry dave and bill great now terry what would you like a original manuscript script copy of the captain's rule or an original painting by one of the oldest artists in South Brunswick? Oh, tough choice. I'm an artist and I'm an historian. Uh, the, uh, the book. Okay, you would like the captain's, the captain's rule. Yep. Then you can read about the whole story, uh, all the stuff around the skirmish and so forth. So Terry gets the Thank manuscript. You. Okay, you got it. And uh, that'll be ready for you in the library. Give it uh, two days. Well, thank you very Uh, much. Today is Tuesday, so it'll be in the library by Thursday at the reference desk. Okay, now Dave and Bill, that leaves you with uh, original painting. And I happen to have more than one original painting. (laughs) So what I'm going to do on Thursday, and you don't have to come in on Thursday, but you could, I'll bring in uh, six paintings 
and you can choose one of the paintings. Now, they're framed, and they're ready to be hung on a wall, okay? So you don't have to do anything with them. You don't have to spend any money to get them set up. They're all ready to go. And these are original. Uh, so, Thank Dave you. and Bill, can you make it to the library on Thursday? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, sounds like a plan. Okay. Excellent. And Randy, will you be there on Thursday? Uh, I will. Don't come too early in the morning, but um, come after 12 and it'll be there for you. <laughs> Oh, okay, ladies, will be open? It will be open. It's just that I have to I have an appointment. I won't be there real early in the morning. <laughs> Randy's very busy. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we, we can't be uh, bothering him with this. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, after lunch, and how late is the library open on Thursday? Well, we're open until um, 9 o'clock. Okay, so from 12 p.m. till 9 o'clock p.m. Yeah, and we're open Friday too. Okay, and Randy, since I'm bringing in six paintings by the original painter uh, artist, you have to uh, be careful with the other ones. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll work that out with you when you are you bringing them tomorrow Ed, or Thursday. You're bringing them tomorrow, right? I'll be bringing them in on Thursday. You're bringing them on Thursday? Okay. Yeah, don't don't bring them in real early, but I, I'll be here. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll I'll come in at twelve o'clock. Okay, that sounds good. I'll probably be here a little bit before that, but that 12 sounds okay, good. Okay, and then your security uh, team can uh, watch the paintings that aren't selected. Okay, yeah, we'll have, a, we'll, we'll have people guarding it, yep. <laughs> right, right, because I have insurance on them, but I want to make sure everything is, is okay. They're okay, thank you very <laughs> much. That, that worked out well. I'm all done, Randy. Yeah, I'm done too, and it was a good presentation, but I also wanted to tell everybody, look at in your email tonight, because I'm going to send you uh, some information about um, reenactments that are happening in December around the, around the holidays. So if you get bored around the holidays, there's reenactments happening in Ocean County and also down in Trenton. So uh, just check the email for that, and we'll uh, we'll um, I'll send it out tonight. I have a British friend who's part of the reenactment. Oh yeah, uh, in which place? Uh, and well, he's uh, oh my goodness, and I'm trying to remember where he's going to be, and it's just incredible when you see one of your friends be an actor in the, in the, in the reenactment process. I mean, it's just an incredible feel. He's a Brit and I think okay. he's, he's in the Black Watch, I think. I can't, I don't know, 24th, in, I think it's the 24th. I'm sorry, but it's an ama amazing thing. So if everybody can go and see that, it's worth, it's worth, it's worth a cold trip. And this was, where, where, is, where is this happening, Bill? Well, he's, it's, it's, they, I mean, I'm not sure which location, but he's been in the Battle of Princeton and the Washington okay. Crossing to Delaware. And, and apparently there's a there's a big organization and I'll have to, and I'm just not, I'm having a brain fart. I'm not remembering the, the details. It's 10 crucial days and I'll send that out tonight. That's part of it, yeah. Oh, great, great. Yeah, yep, I'll send it to you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank thanks, you. thanks for coming out. It was great, thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night Randy. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. It's like the Waltons here. <laughs> yes, God boy. <laughs>